So, we're going to be looking at um, part of John 12 in our service this morning. This is the, the lovely account of Mary washing the feet of Jesus with expensive perfume and then um, brushing it away with her hair. It just seems like a strange thing to do and you wonder what it's there for in the Bible. So let's be asking that question as we look at it. What's it there? What's it mean to us now? What does it say to us who are divorced by many centuries from, from that sort of thing? Um, but before we get that length, some words from Psalm 51 and they simply remind us of how we should be approaching God and in essence it's just reminded us to approach God the same way as Mary did with a, with a real sense of submission and humility. It says there, the sacrifices of God, are, are the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. God, you will not despise a broken and a humbled heart. So let's just pray before we sing our first song. So Father, as we come to worship you now, we proclaim your holy name and we humble ourselves before you. We acknowledge our own sinfulness and our wretchedness and we see your majesty. We see you, almighty God, seated upon your throne, the one true living God. And so help us now to lift our voices to you, to open our hearts to you, to make a joyful noise in your ears. May your Holy Spirit fill us and equip us, call us and inspire us, and help us to honour you in all that we do in here this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. So let's sing about God's great love for us in our first song. It's going to come up on the screen. Here is love, vast as an ocean. Yeah. 
We're going to put the words of the confession up on the screen now. We're going to use these in a moment or two, but before we use these together, let's take a moment with God and to reflect and to take to Him anything that we feel that we ought to. And as we reflect on our week, we recall some words from Isaiah where he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly <coughs> repent, have mercy on us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips. And our mouth will be O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord is I'm going to put the words of our psalm up on the screen now. Psalm 126. It's not a long psalm, it's only half a dozen verses or so. And this is one of several psalms that, if you were reading it out of the Bible, you would see had a title over it called um, A Song of Ascents. And when you see that title, The Song of Ascents, it reminds us that this was a psalm that pilgrims always used as they made their way to Jerusalem, generally for the, the Passover um, festival. And this psalm was written sometime after Israel had been um, released from captivity in Egypt. And this was them um, looking back and reflecting and just thanking God for his deliverance, thanking God for being with them and looking for God to continue with them. So we're just going to use the psalm in, 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 in a similar way. We're going to use it to say thank you to God for his great deliverance of us through Jesus and as a means of um, travelling on in our journey with him. So we'll say a verse about it. I'll begin with verse 1. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our minds were filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. Then as he said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord had done great things for us. We were joyful. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like water. Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. The one who sows in tears will reap with shouts of joy. The one who sows in tears will reap with shouts of joy. The one who sows in tears will reap with shouts of joy. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now and it shall be forever. Amen. Lee, who's going to come and read for us? Thanks. Readings taken from John 12, 1, verses 1 and 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of fragrant oil, pure and expensive lard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, 
who was about to betray him, said, Why wasn't this fragrant oil sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was the thief. He was in charge of the money by and would steal part of what was put in it. Jesus answered, Leave her alone. She has kept it for the, the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with, with you, but you do not always have me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Please thank you. Father, help us now to think about these words. Help us to, to know what you're saying to us, to hear your voice. Help us to receive this with gladness and find ways of working out how to live according to it every day. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now those of you who were here last week might remember um, that I was talking about a painting by Joachim Buchler that I saw in London last year in the National Gallery. And I, I just said to you it was a busy painting, one with lots going on in a, in a kitchen in a big mansion house. And when I was thinking about today's reading a little bit earlier in the house, because I had been thinking about paintings, another one came to mind um, that connects with this reading where Mary washes the feet of, of Jesus. And this particular painting, I'm not going to do a whole series of painting, I'm just, this is the last time. Um, this particular painting was by a, a guy called Tintoretto. You've, you've probably heard the name, one of the, one of the great masters. He was probably the most prolific painter in Italy during the, the 16th century. He just painted so many different paintings. And he lived in Venice. And if you've ever been, visited that enchanting city, you will maybe have noted, if, you, if you're into artwork and paintings, you, you may have noted that there were, there were several churches dotted around the, the various canals of the, of the city centre where Tintoretto had painted frescoes, um, that's, that's paintings on walls and on the ceilings of, of the churches. I can just go in and have a look at these most marvellous um, paintings. The most famous example in the UK isn't in the National Gallery, the National Gallery in London, it's in the National Gallery in, in Scotland. And it has a very famous picture of his where um, it depicts Jesus getting down on his knees and washing the feet of his disciples. But it brought to mind another, which is, which is less known by the same artist, which is a painting of this passage, which shows Mary on her knees at Jesus' feet, anointing them with this oil and then washing them away with her hair. Now, I must say, I don't like the painting. Um, I'm not a big fan of it. I think it's dull, I think it's flat, I think the colours are insipid, I think there's no life in it. When you look at the face of Jesus, when you look at the face of um, Mary in it, they're, they're expressionless. And yet, to my mind, this must have been one of the, the, the most tender and profoundly moving encounters that you will discover in, in the New Testament. So let's look at this moving and, and, and profound moment that we get a little glimpse of here. It takes place, we're told, in Bethany. We're told also, although not in this particular passage, that it takes place in the house of Simon the leper. And a number of his friends are there, names that we know well, Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And they're having a meal. And it seems as if this is some sort of celebratory meal or some sort of thanksgiving meal for Jesus. To thank him for what he's done in raising Lazarus to, to life again. So they've all got together, they're having a meal, they're celebrating and they're showing their, their gratitude and their, their thanks to Jesus. And it's in the midst of this wonderful celebration, this very joyful occasion, but Mary does something that's pretty unusual. She does something that appalls some of her guests and at the same time really touches Jesus' heart. She takes a bottle of nard and she pours it on the feet of Jesus. 
Nard sometimes referred to in the Bible as Nard, sometimes it's referred to as Spike and Nard. If you see either of those names, they're talking about the same thing. But essentially, it's an oil that derives from a plant that is found really only in northern India and in Nepal, in the, in, in the Himalayas. So in an area when there was no train or plane, this would have been difficult to get hold of. And this would have been very costly. And the fact that it's described as being stored in an alabaster jar, which itself is very expensive, sort of gives us a, a fair indication that this was something that, um, which cost a lot and would have been a trouble getting a hold of, had to be brought a long way. And there are three things that struck me about Mary um, in, in this encounter with Jesus. And that's just what I want to share with you this morning, these three things. The first thing that strikes me about Mary is that she is portrayed as being extraordinarily humble. And I think that is probably something that comes across quite well in, in Tinderetto's pain, because we see her down on her, on her knees, um, right at the, at the feet of Jesus. And although it wasn't exactly an uncommon thing for um, a host to do for a guest who had arrived at his house. Given the fact that this is a dry and dusty climate and there were no proper roads as such, or very few proper roads as such, when somebody had walked a long way in open, open sandals, their feet were dirty. And so very often um, a host would have washed the feet of their guests. But they wouldn't have done it with nard, and they wouldn't have done it themselves if they could have avoided it because this was a very menial task it was a demeaning task in a way and so if they could have they would have given their servant this job of washing the feet of one of their guests and so in a way it just reminds us of how we ought to approach Jesus how we ought to approach God with the same sense of submission and humility that we see um, demonstrated um, by Mary. And so we need to remember who Jesus really is. I know we can be very palsy with Jesus and we can talk to him just like we would talk to anybody else. And that's fine and he likes that and he wants us to do that. But we still need to remember who he really is. He is the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth. He is the creator and the sustainer of the whole universe. He is God. He is the only living God. We have all sorts of gods that we raise up throughout our lives. Things that just demand our time and effort. And we give so much more to them than we do to the only living God. But he is the only true living God. And yes, we can call him our friend. He tells us that. And uh, he tells us, or John tells us, that Jesus says that um, Jesus calls us his friends as well. If you remember in John, it says, I don't call you slaves anymore because a slave doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my Father. So we can call Jesus friends. He will call us his friends. Um, yes, we can casually drop in on Jesus anytime we like, day or night. His door is always open to us. He'll never turn us away. We can walk right into the, the very throne room of God whenever we like, without introduction or without fear. And that's wonderful. It's the way he wants it. But we must remember that he is God. Almighty God. And we should have an attitude of submission and reverence towards him. And Mary was demonstrating that to us. She knew him well. She knew him better than most people. She could have had conversations with him that maybe most of us would not dare to have had. And yet she gets down at his feet in humble submission. An illustration of how we should be in the presence of God. The second thing that I saw, or felt I saw about Mary's encounter with Jesus is that her gift to Jesus was extreme. I don't know if it <coughs> registers when it tells us that this cost, this would have cost about 300 denarii, what that actually means. Well, we understand that to be about a year's wages. That would have been the cost of Mary purchasing this nard, about the cost of a year's wages. So imagine everything that you have earned 
this last year and you take it off to Harrods and you buy a bottle of perfume with everything that you have earned. That's what we're talking about here. Something very, very expensive. People sometimes bought Nord as an investment. They knew that it kept its value. They knew that they could easily sell it if they ever needed to realise the money for some reason. I suppose in a way it's a wee bit like people, um, people who, who would invest in, in gold these days. No matter what's happening in the world and, and prices shoot up and shoot down and we see because of the Ukrainian situation the price of oil and uh, heating oil and petrol and lots of things shooting up but they'll, they'll maybe shoot down again as well. And all the uncertainties of the world, what people, what investors do, is that they run to buy gold because it holds its value and over time is likely to increase in value rather than go down. And so people treat it now, spike and art, in exactly the same way. It was their investment. So in Mary's terms, this was probably then her life savings. It wasn't just a year's wages. For Mary, this was probably her life series, savings. And in a very precious and in a very deliberate moment, she gives everything that she's got to Jesus. In this moment of humble submission, she pours her, her life savings over Jesus' feet. In this moment of humble submission, she empties her bank account over Jesus' feet. In this moment of humble submission, she pours her security for the future over Jesus' feet. And once she's done it, there's no going back. You're pouring liquid out of a bottle. She's not going to get it back in there again. This is a one-off total submission to Jesus. And when I thought harder about that and the enormity of it, I just felt this shames us all on so many different levels. Because really it just questions our commitment to the one who gave everything for us. We just sung about the one who gives everything to us. Here is love vast as the ocean. The one who poured out his life on a cross for us. And it questions our commitment to him. When did any of us ever lay everything that we have down at the feet of Jesus. I haven't. And I don't think any of us have. Most times, if we were honest, I imagine, we we'll hardly give Jesus the time of day. Most times, if we talk to him, we only talk to him in a way that we sort of we slotted in because we're, we're busy people. And we only talk to him if we're not too busy doing something else. It's like, it's like we treat him casually. We talk to him only when we get ourselves into a jam. And then the rest of the time when life is fine, we, we just breeze along. Or our Bibles, we, we leave them on our, our bookshelves. They, they, they gather dust there because we're not interested enough to hear what Jesus might be having to say back to us. Because that's his word. That's the the main way in which he speaks back to us. Or we pop our money onto the collection plate, usually so long as we haven't got other plans for it. Could it ever be said of any one of us that our love was extreme for Jesus? And yet, and I think this is where it hurts most, and yet it's the only sort of disciple that Jesus is interested in. The extreme disciple. Is that not the complaint that Jesus makes in the book of Revelation to the church of Laodicea? He says, I wish you were either hot or cold, but you're, you're not. You're just lukewarm. And you know, lukewarm's no good to me. So, take it as an encouragement. It's not, it's not a telling off in any sense. It just, it's an encouragement. An encouragement to look at our lives again, to look at afresh at who we are and how we relate to God, to look at our lives and work out what is it that needs to be warmed up again in our, in our spiritual life, in our life of devotion, in our life of commitment to Jesus. What has become, what are we allowed to become just glowing embers that now need to be allowed to be 
fanned into flame and in life again for God, so that we are living committed lives for Him. Pray that the fire of God's Holy Spirit will ignite, reignite a passion for Jesus in your life. So that's the second thing that it made me think of in Mary's life. And the third thing is, Mary's gift was unselfconscious. Unselfconscious. Not only did Mary give the gift of expensive oil to Jesus, she got down on her feet, her hands and knees, and she wiped it away with her hair. Which means she let down her hair in public in that time, in that culture. Something which a Jewish woman would rarely have done. I think maybe we don't understand this because we're, we're just of a different culture and of a different time. To do this was very humbling and very perhaps humiliating for Mary because the only person, the only woman who let down their hair in public in Jesus' day were prostitutes. And so this was a deeply intimate moment and this was a self-exposing moment. This was Mary just opening up herself to Jesus and saying, here I am without any fear. And while this image is sort of weird to our modern day eyes and thinking, in that moment it was an expression of uninhibited worship and submission to Jesus. And she didn't care what other people thought about what she was doing. All she cared about was being close to Jesus. All she cared about was submitting to him. All she cared about was this moment of intimate worship. And so it just begs the question, is that a picture of us? Is it a picture of me? Is it a picture of you? How self-conscious are any of us of being, of being known as a follower of Jesus? Do we care? Do we care if other people know that we are Christians? Do we care in our place of work? Do we care in our home and amongst our neighbours and our friends? Do we care if other people know that we're followers of Jesus? Do we care if other people think we're daft? Or whether we're wasting our time? Do we care that it can be costly? That's what this image forces me to ask myself. Some people will have something to say if your love for Jesus is extreme. Judas Iscariot in this passage had something to say about Mary's behaviour. He complained. He said, what a waste. What a total waste that was. He said, you could have taken this, you could have sold it for 300 denarii, you could have given that to the poor. Think of what a year's wages could have done for people who were less fortunate than you were. But you know, in saying that, he just revealed his heart, didn't he? He revealed that he thought this was too much of a sacrifice to make for Jesus. That this was too much love to show him. That this was too much devotion to give to Jesus. And to be honest, people will sometimes have something to say if you live with extreme love for Jesus, if you live humbly before him, if you're open about your love and your dedication to Jesus, people will sometimes have something to say to you. But the real question is, do you care about that? Mary didn't, and neither should we. And what I think is lovely about this story is the, is the way that it concludes. Mary says, poured it all out before everybody who's there, not caring what they thought, only caring about opening her heart to Jesus and giving everything that she had to give to him in that moment. And then Jesus comes to her defense. <coughs> Jesus says to everybody who's criticized, now leave her alone. He saw her heart. He understood the cost. And if we are criticized because we're followers of Jesus, well then we can expect nothing less from Jesus too. He will defend us because he sees our heart. He knows our motivation. 
He approves of our devotion. He, he approves of our extreme love if we have it to show. And is it not much better to be like Mary, extreme in our love for Jesus, than to be like, Je to, to be like Judas, simply criticizing others for showing that much love because they didn't want to have to show it themselves? Let's pray. Father God, we just want to stop and say thank you. Thank you that your love is as vast as the ocean. That nothing can compare to it and that you show it to us. That you show it to us not only in your daily provision and wonder of your world around us and in your companionship every day, but you show it to us in the sacrifice of the cross in the shame and the humiliation and the pain and suffering of that place. You gave us everything. Lord, we couldn't even begin to thank you or to repay you for that debt. But what we do pray is that you would help us to show our gratitude to you by the way that we live. Help us to be sold out to be more committed, to be more deeply in love with you, to care less about what other things as we live this extreme life of devotion to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The next song that we're going to put up on the screen um, gives us an opportunity in some ways just to acknowledge what this passage has helped us to acknowledge this morning. That Jesus is our friend. We can be close to him. We can be with him any time of the day or night. But he is King of Kings. We're going to stand and sing King of Kings Majesty.
So we turn to the Lord in prayer. We pray as Jesus taught us as we say together, Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And the right of spiritual salvation. O Lord, save the Queen. And the right of the Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. And the church shall be O Lord, save your people. And bless those who you have chosen. Give peace in our time, O Lord. And let your glory be over all the earth. O God, make clean our hearts within us. And the peace of our The collect of the fifth Sunday of Lent. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord God, we thank you that you welcome us into your presence. You're delighted when we spend time in your company. Lord, we're sorry that we don't spend half enough time there. And that sometimes we, we treat you like a utility, something to be turned on and off at our own convenience. So help us to be more like Mary, humble and surrendered, sold out and committed, openly confessing our allegiance to you in the everyday circumstances of life. Lord, we want to pray for our parish this morning, for all who make up our church family and all that goes on within it. Please bless our worship and our witness. Help us to remember who it is that we serve. And help us to give of our very best in every way that we can. And may the community around us see our love for you. And show us how best we can serve that community in your name. We pray for those who are training as parish readers that they may feel their call confirmed in their hearts for the members of our select vestries, that they would be wise as they make decisions about our churches. For those who teach and help in our Sunday schools and our boys' brigade, that they may have energy and inspiration. For those who lead and attend our Mother's Union, that they would know your peace, your presence and your blessing. And for all who attend our services each week, that they may encounter the life-giving, life-empowering presence of God. And we pray for those in our parish and community who struggle with daily living, for those who find it hard to cope with life, who find themselves feeling down or depressed, for those who live with pain every day and those for whom there's no medical answer. For those who wait the result of tests, for those trying to cope with grief, for those who feel alone and unloved. Lord, give wisdom and strength to those who need it. Pick up those who fall down. Support those who are weary. Bring healing to those who seek it. And give rest to those who are tired and worn out. And let's just take a few moments in the stillness to talk to God about our own thoughts and needs and the needs of those who are important to us. We 
We're going to put the words of the fourth collect from morning prayer up on the screen. And we're going to use this as we pray together to ask God just to remind us of who he is and also that he would guide us and keep us. We'll say together, Heavenly Father, <coughs> Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that your Holy Spirit may so guide and govern us that in all the cares and occupations of our daily life we may never forget your presence but may remember that we are always walking in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for each other and ourselves with the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.